Welcome back to Nature's Corner. My name is Erin Shaw. I'm a naturalist with Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Today's show is all about connections with wildlife and people. We have a very special guest with us today, Joe Dorian from Ohio School of Falconry. Um, there's no coincidence that uh, people with common interests meet up and, well, they say birds of a feather flock <laughs> together, right? Uh, I, I have heard about the Ohio School of Falconry and I've heard your name. Uh, I was doing some research online the other day and came across one of your programs at Camp Kern. So I did some research, I made some phone calls, I sent some emails, and here we are today. So thank you for coming to Caesar Creek. More than Creek. happy to. Yes. Happy to. And as we've been talking, I, I've realized that we've, we have a lot of common background, yeah. actually, uh, common experiences. So um, thank you again for being here. So tell us a little bit about your background and, and sure. uh, what you do. Um, so my background has largely been in education. Um, for about 23 years, I worked inside of large corporations doing leadership development, team development, um, working with um, individuals within the organizations trying to grow and build relationship, learn how to communicate better, how to really do the human side of their work better. And so back in when I was a child, they had read us a book called My Side of the Mountain, which I think we had talked about that you had uh, read as well. And um, a lot of falconers today, that is where the falconry journey for them started, was a book like that or an encounter like that when they were very young in age. Um, and it's something that started that, um, uh, that dreaming, if you will, of what could be. And so, you know, as a 12-year-old kid, I grew up in the Columbus area and uh, just outside of Arlington. And, uh, you know, I carried around a leather glove and a little whistle in case I could run across some falconer's escaped bird. I was going to call it down to my glove and it was going to live in my garage and the space that I had set up for the pony that never arrived at Christmas. Um, and so, you know, uh, as life does, other things got in the way, uh, football, wrestling, um, girls. Um, and so, you know, when I graduated with my master's degree from Ohio State University in um, in leadership development and uh, organizational development. Um, I was looking for something to spend this Amazon gift card I got on and I said to myself, what is it that I was interested in when I was a kid? Falconry came up and um, I found a book on falconry called North American Falconry and Hunting Hawks, which is kind of considered the Bible of, of falconry here in the United States. And um, my wife said I never left the uh, hotel room when we went on vacation two days after I got it in the mail. Uh, I just read it cover to cover. And that was what really sparked, re-sparked that interest 15 years ago. That's awesome. I think a lot of people, I, I do, have a, a connection, a wonder, you know, a, a sense of awe, especially with the birds and the raptors. Yeah. And to be able to see one and experience one up close is really, really something special. So um, what is falconry? Well, falconry, as it's defined, um, is the training of raptors, birds of prey, uh, usually hawks, eagles, and falcons, uh, to partner with humans in the taking of game, game species. So here in Ohio, most of the uh, birds that we utilize in the sport are um, red-tailed hawks, Harris's hawks, uh, goshawks, um, and basically what we're chasing is, uh, is squirrels and rabbits and sometimes pheasants and ducks. So okay. it differs in different parts of the country, uh, but the one key thing is falconry is a hunting sport. Um, you know, you can differentiate it from other aspects of individuals that work with raptors in the factor that our partnership with those raptors is predi predicated on us both working towards the taking of game. Okay. I also think that the, the sport of hunting is, is important and something that's, you know, um, I've been raised with yeah. and it's just a it's a part of life for me it's maybe a religious experience when you go out and you're out there yeah. you know in the wild and uh, and having a bird that you can do this with it's interesting that you said the the word uh, kind of religious experience because um, you know falconers come from all backgrounds from all walks of life and I think the thing that unites us is our love of the sport and these raptors. Um, so whatever faith background you come from, uh, in many ways, the practice of falconry, the partnership with this bird, whether you catch game or not, just the fact that you're out there 
in the wild partnering with a bird, um, it's, it's in some ways a beautiful expression of, of faith and spirituality. It's something that I think um, we as humans have become very, very disconnected with, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a way for, for folks to reconnect in a very, very personal. You don't find anywhere else in nature the type of relationship that a falconer has with a bird of prey because you have two, sometimes you have three and four different species working together. In the UK, they'll use dogs, ferrets, uh, uh, hawks, and humans uh, in the pursuit of game. And those animals learn to work together because of relationship. Yes, it's a spiritual experience, that's a, that's a better word. And that trust that mm -hmm. you build is, is so important. And um, something, I, like you said, I think that we're losing. Yeah, and tr you know, it's interesting you say trust as well, because trust is, uh, when we first started to, uh, to, to kind of plan and organize our thoughts around what was the purpose and mission of the Ohio School of Falconry, you know, I was noticing as a falconer, I've been a falconer for almost 15 years, I was noticing as a falconer that a lot of the work that I was doing with these birds was very similar to the work I was doing with the humans that I was working with, you know, whether Huntington Banks or Ohio Health. Um, when I would be called in to work with either uh, uh, coaching a manager or an executive or working with a team that was in some level of dysfunction, it all came down to trust. And so I say trust is trust, whether you're a hawk or a human. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, part of what we're about is I say we're a trust company. We're hopefully helping individuals understand the nature of trust through the use of uh, an interaction with birds of prey that better helps them in their human relationships as well. Hmm. So you think you could do like therapy birds? Like they have therapy dogs? Actually they do. Um, we actually uh, got a call to work with a gentleman who utilizes uh, wildlife um, rehab animals that he's worked with to condition to be able to work with humans in a form of ecotherapy. It's pretty amazing. That is really cool. Okay, so back to falconry. Um, it's, did you say it's a two year? So the sport of falconry here in the United States is one of the most heavily regulated field sports. Um, in fact, it is the most heavily regulated field sport in the United States. There are a lot of folks that will, when they first start to get into the sport, disagree with that heavy regulation because if you go to the UK, they have almost no regulation whatsoever. You can walk, anybody can walk into a, a breeder and buy a hawk or an owl. And that has its own implications of, of potential disaster, if you will. The Harris hawk from the United States is one of their newest invasive species. Oh. Um, so here in the United States, uh, the regulations are built in a way to protect the native resource, the natural resource, which is birds of prey. So we have a two-year apprenticeship system. Uh, somebody has to find, here in the state of Ohio, has to find a sponsor, somebody who is a general or a master class falconer, that will agree to take them on and work with them for two years. Uh, once they've actually gotten somebody to agree to take them on, they can take a federal test. Uh, here in the state of Ohio, it's administered through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And um, once they pass that test with a score of 80 or above, uh, they and their sponsor will work on building the facilities which will house their bird of prey. And then once they have that inspected and they are actually uh, granted their, their falconry license, then they work with their sponsor to trap. Uh, here in Ohio, uh, you can either start out with a, a kestrel, which we kind of frown on, because unless you have a sponsor who's worked with kestrels, they're a very fragile bird, yeah. um, or red-tailed hawk. Uh, red-tailed hawk is pretty much the workhorse of North American falconry. And so you can go out and trap a bird from the wild. Now, we oftentimes get some pushback from people when they say, you know, how dare you trap a, a, a wild bird to use in the sport of falconry. But what people don't realize is that according to government research, um, and this, this type of research has been done time and time and time again, and the percentages almost always come out the same, 75 to 90 percent of every hatch uh, uh, of birds of prey, so every bird that's born in May of this coming year, or of this year, uh, 75 to 90 percent of them will be dead by October. They all die within six months, largely because of man-made things. Mm. They get hit by cars, they uh, fly into windows or fences, they land on transformers, uh, they uh, eat poison mice and rats. And sometimes, even if they don't eat poison mice and rats, they're eating other critters that have you know, herbicide, pesticide, toxins that have built up in them. And so it reduces their immune system, making them much more susceptible to things like West Nile virus, 
you know, avian flu, that kind of stuff. So when you have a bird, you're, you're taking care of it, you're feeding it, you're giving it a really nice place. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, we like to say that it's kind of grad school for red tails, if you will. Sometimes the bird, because most falconers will trap a bird in the fall, will train it and hunt with it. So that bird is actually assured of surviving um, some of the most dangerous period for them. Um, and so we'll trap it in the fall. Chances are that bird that we trapped was going to be one of the, you know, nine, you know, 90% that wasn't going to make it. So we basically ensure it has survival. It's, it's allowed to, uh, to fly four to five times a week. Um, falconers can become somewhat obsessive about getting in the field with their birds. Uh, that's why we always preach balance. Uh, fly four to five times a week with the bird, uh, in which case the bird could fly off at any time, but the bird learns to trust us and realizes that we have snacks. And so um, life is pretty easy. You have food every day, you're flown four to five times a week. Um, you know, I always say they have a great health care plan, you know, because falconers will, as they uh, start the year, put you know, aside some money in case they have to uh, get their bird, you know, some treatment for anything, whether it be, you know, internal parasites or, or whatnot. Yeah. So uh, falconers are some of the best conservationists. Hunters are some of the best conservationists because of the care that we have, not just for, in our cases, the birds of prey that we use and partner with, but even more so the prey species. That's fantastic. So <clears throat> last month we had um, Glenn Helen on the mm -hmm. show, and you know we also have raptors here. So conservation is, is yep. one of our main um, missions, and yeah. as of you. So tell us how how your programs are different from the education. Sure. So um, first of all, Glenn Helen, fantastic. One of our great organizations in the state that does a lot of work educating the public, mm -hmm. um, but also even more importantly, they do a lot of work helping to rehab wildlife. Um, that's one of the things that we, when we developed the school, uh, our, our tagline is conservation, period, preservation, period, education. Conservation of birds of prey that we all love and the wild places they live, preservation of the sport of falconry, or both of those through education. So our support to organizations like Glen Helen, um, you know, we've worked with the Ohio Bird Sanctuary quite a bit over the years, uh, Medina Raptor Center, the Ohio Wildlife Rehab Center, always looking to partner with other organizations, is to support the work that they do on the front lines to take care of those injured birds of prey and other members of the natural wildlife. So how we differ is, both of our messages is about conservation. Um, our message is to understand the nature of partnership in the sport of falconry. So we have a, a permit with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we were only the sixth school of falconry, so we had the sixth permit granted. First one that was granted about 10 to 15 years. Um, and our permit allows us to have people handle uh, these native species, these raptors. Um, our birds have to be captive bred. Um, and so we are allowed to have people fly the birds to the glove. We teach them, we have to be right next to them, but as they're interacting with the birds, we're teaching not just about, you know, you know, hey, get a great picture with your bird on your glove, but more about understanding the nature of how do you read the bird's behavior? How do you understand what that bird is trying to tell you in terms of whether I trust you or not? Um, and then the partnership piece. So. Um, most of the raptor education groups that are out there have what they call a raptor education permit, which allows them to use injured wildlife, uh, birds that would not have been able to survive in the wild, um, but it negates them from being allowed to let people interact with those birds. Uh, it's illegal for a non-falconer or a non-raptor rehabber traditionally to um, allow anybody, uh, or it's, it's illegal for a raptor rehabber or a falconer to let somebody who is not one of those hold a bird of prey, a native bird of prey. And so uh, our permit allows us to do that a little bit more close up. Um, we stayed a for-profit because we feel as a for-profit we're better able to um, leverage and give back to organizations like um, Ohio Bird Sanctuary, uh, working with Glen Helen, they do a fantastic job down here. Um, you know, uh, Raptor Hollow Sanctuary we're starting to work with, Medina Raptor Center. Um, Ohio Wildlife Rehab Center in Columbus. So we do that by our educational pursuits and a portion of the money that we make in terms of our profit and revenue uh, goes towards buying food, doing fundraisers for them, uh, doing educational pursuits uh, for their staff. 
Okay, so the Ohio School of Falconry is different from the falconry, the two-year apprenticeship. It is indeed. Because you can come and offer um, a one hour or, you know, a full day, whatever, sure. just small samples and experiences and um, connections that people can make. So, so that's a good point. Um, so here in Ohio, we have a wonderful organization called the Ohio Falconry Association. It is the, I guess you would say, the professional association for falconers here, although it's a nonprofit. And um, I served, actually, I had the honor of serving as their first apprentice director in the state of Ohio from 2010 to 2015. So if we have people who approach us and in, are truly interested in the sport, we always remind them that um, our classes are not required to become a falconer. In fact, we try to direct them back to the Ohio Falconry Association because they're um, looking for something a little bit different than somebody who's looking just to come in to get the experience of you know, learning about the sport of falconry and have a bird fly to them. Mm -hmm. We do, however, teach actual skills that a falconer would use. That's very different than most of the other schools that are associated with resorts. Um, you know, we use a simulation that we created, it's used nowhere else in the United States. Um, although I think a couple of the other groups that we've helped start down south of starting to use some of the same, you know, principles or approach. We simulate and pretend that each of our students is a new apprentice. And we pretend that you have just trapped your first you know, red-tailed hawk and that you're training it, which normally takes about three to four weeks. And so our simulation in our class is teaching you all the different pieces, parts that U.S. Fish and Wildlife wants us to share with you. Uh, but we pepper that information in to you know, when we're talking about the anatomy of a bird and how, how you have a bird on the glove and the different pieces of equipment. So we try to make it more poignant because as, a, as an adult educator, you know, I realize that retention of that knowledge, uh, rather than just having a, a cool picture of a bird to walk away with, understanding things like the nature of where the term fed up comes from, that a bird has a crop uh, similar to the gizzard on a chicken. And when it fills up with food, it doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Little pieces like that that help people understand and connect, not just with falconry, but also birds of prey in a much more deep way. Hmm. So tell us uh, about some of your programs that you offer. Sure. So um, we continue to always try to look at how we can do things newly and differently. So um, our first two programs that we um, offered and still offer um, are an introduction to falconry which is uh, a 45 minute to an hour long program. Sometimes it goes a little longer. My wife says that sometimes I get so excited that you know I wanna make sure that nobody walks away without having that full experience. Um, I say it's kind of that spiritual interaction with the bird. Um, so the introduction to falconry basically teaches the basic foundation of the sport of falconry, birds of prey that are used, um, all the stuff that Fish and Wildlife wants you to cover, but in that, in that uh, simulation, it covers what will be weeks one through four, which is getting that bird up and flying to you on a crayons line, which is a long leash, uh, about 100 feet. And so those individuals that come in for that class will have four to five flights to the glove where the bird is flying to them on a long leash. Uh, they get to hold uh, and interact with owls and see you know, falcons and all sorts of different birds. Um, the other program that we offer is a walk with hawks. Uh, it is basically includes everything in the introduction program. Plus at the end we say, okay, so you've just trained your bird uh, and now let's take it for its first hunt. Even though it's not really a hunt, it's just a walk. And so we take that bird and we take it off the hook. Uh, off the hook is a term that comes from H.F. Falcon. Take the bird off the hook, throw it up into a tree, and then we go for a walk. And that 30 minute walk, that bird is shooting through the trees and you know, when you recall it, it'll come flying down to your glove. So those individuals will have the opportunity not just to learn and practice the skills of how do you cast a bird off and call it to the glove while on the crayons line, like in the introduction program, but they'll be able to get the experience of a, a bird coming 70 feet out of the top of a tree to land gently on their glove mm -hmm. and really understand the true nature of what that trust looks like between you and that bird because he's not tethered to anything. He knows that he can fly off at any time, yet he willingly comes down to you um, because of that partnership. He has no fear of you. So do you go to places or people come to you or both? Sure. So um, when we first started, um, our first two years, we were located on, uh, we're lo our main location is Columbus. So right now we're actually, we're pretty excited because we're just getting ready to put down our, plant our first roots on what will be the first dedicated falconry center here in the Midwest. 
um, and one of the first in the United States. And so um, we actually are at a place called Camp Mary Orton in Columbus, Ohio. That's where our home location is. Although we do offer our classes in different locations throughout the state. So uh, here in Southwestern Ohio, we uh, just entered into an agreement last year with Camp Kern uh, to offer classes on a monthly basis down here. It's very excited. We did, um, had great success our first two uh, uh, months. And so we just are working on dates for all of next year. That's great. Um, that's how I found you too. That's how you found me? Yes. Yeah. They've been great. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful location. It reminds us a lot of Camp Mary Orton where we're at in Columbus. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, so we are for profit, but we want to be able to support the nonprofit work of organizations that are focused on conservation and education. So when we look at a location where we want to be, we don't just go to a farm or some place that we can, you know, we can, in fact, to be quite honest, we could probably, you know, rent a farm field for a lot cheaper than we can, um, you know, in our partnerships with Camp Mary Orton or, or the YMCA. The reason we chose the YMCA, which runs Camp Current, sure. the reason we chose that is because those organizations have a great track record of, of working for the community, helping mm -hmm. um, individuals in need, uh, growth and development of communities and individuals in those communities, and they have a nature focus. And so it's a wonderful partnership because everything that we do in the relationship to, um, you know, uh, uh, paying, if you will, for the right to be able to be there, um, allows us to give back to the community and support the work that they're doing. That's great. So it's health and wellness and getting outdoors, enjoying life. And, Connection. And us with kids, too. Camp Kern is... But, but your programs are open to anyone. And open to anyone. But one of the agreements, one of the pieces of the agreement that we have with any uh, uh, location that we have where there's, they do summer camps is um, we provide three to four free um, days of programming for their kids as part of their camp. So those kids will come in and we basically will be providing our classes and access to our birds free of charge to that, um, to that camp uh, for their children. So that's... What a neat way to get a kid excited, you know. Oh. Reading a book is important, but having a bird come to your camp is, is uh, phenomenal. Well, and those birds are flying to those kids' gloves. So those, yeah. I mean, we, we've worked with kids as young as, you know, four and five that, um, you know, and our birds are selected. So we've worked over the last five years to select birds that are very, very gentle and very, very relaxed. I mean, once again, they are wild birds, but um, they have been conditioned such a way that when we're right there with that child, that bird can safely fly and land on that glove. And um, the look on those kids' face when they see that happen, uh, they start to understand a little bit more about the nature of trust, but hopefully it also plants a seed very similar to that seed that was planted in me when I was 12, and my teacher started to read the book, My Side of the Mountain. That's our goal is we wanna help grow uh, a future generation of conservationists, hunters, falconers would be great, uh, but at least they walk away with, especially kids who might be coming to some of these camps that might not necessarily get out in nature that much. Kind of teach them to look around wherever you're at. Nature is always around you. Whether you live in the country or you live in downtown, there are always ways to see nature at its best. That's great. So. Um we're getting ready to go meet the birds. Sure. Is there anything else here real quick? Sure. So uh, this is some of the equipment that we use in the sport of falconry. Uh, the sport of falconry has been around for a very long time. People don't realize that it's, it's been around for over 6,000 years. Uh, it started in the Far East. Whether it's China or Japan, we're not entirely certain. But it moved its way westward, um, largely with the Mongol invasions. Genghis Khan and his grandson Kublai Khan were both big falconers. Um, and uh, it changed. I say it became really a sport with the advent of, of gunpowder in the 1500s, 1600s, because before that it was a form of subsistence hunting. You know, you would have a bird of prey at the house to go out, just like you'd have a bow and arrow or a spear, and it was a way to get food for the table. After the 15, 1600s, what you found was falconry was kept alive largely because of royalty. And so a lot of the things that we think of today as being falconry, historical falconry, are just those things that were from the 14, 1500s forward. So the equipment itself largely has not changed since the advent of the sport 6,000 years ago. 
There are some things like radio transmitters that we use to track the bird if they fly off. But everything that you see here, minus our friend Diego the macaw, um, is, uh, is stuff that you would have found 6,000 years ago in this practice in the sport. So um, every bird actually wears a pair of anklets. Uh, these are called jesses. There's always a swivel attached and then a leash. This is a traditional setup. Uh, some of the things that you might find different are that we use different materials to make, for instance, leashes and anklets, uh, but the same setup uh, was perfected 6,000 years ago. Um, hoods, uh, these are the things that a lot of people, it's an iconic part of the sport. People see it and they go, oh, I recognize that. That's for a bird of prey. And I always ask people, what do you think the reason for this is? Why do you utilize um, a hood on a bird because it can seem, if you don't realize it, almost like it's, um, you know, you're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're, um, you're inferring, not inferring, but you're, you're pushing your agenda on the bird. This actually is something that once the bird learns to wear it and realizes what it does, they will actually lean into it as you're putting the hood on it. Uh, this blocks out all of their uh, visual perception uh, and largely um, helps them to relax because they, they, they don't have the fears of constantly being on the lookout for things that might be trying to kill and eat them. Um, now today, most of the birds that we use today, we utilize uh, traveling boxes, which we'll show you one later. We call them giant hoods, and it does the same exact thing. Um, the birds will freely, when they fly in after a hunt, jump right into the box, turn around and pull a foot up and go to sleep. Um, we also have lures. So when we talk about lures, uh, we train birds to fly to the glove. We're going to show you what it looks like to fly a bird to the glove uh, for a tidbit. But let's say you have a bird that's eaten too much. Um, you fed it a little bit more and when you waited it was uh, a little heavier than you thought. You throw it up in a tree and it doesn't want to come down. Well you have to have a way to get that bird down, especially if there's something dangerous like a, a bald eagle. Last year we had our red tail up in a tree and she didn't see a bald eagle coming in trying to kill her. So we had to get her down very quickly. Um, and so a lure, they are, are conditioned to realize that it has a large piece of meat, a much larger reward on it, uh, and that when you swing this and throw it out, they go, oh, that's like dessert. Of course I'm coming down to you. So this is a lure that we would traditionally use with a falcon, uh, and it is used not just for recall, uh, but it's also used to, uh, to help that bird stay in shape. Uh, to condition it for grabbing because falcons will grasp uh, birds out of the sky as they're chasing them. And then also this is a lure that would be used for a hawk. Uh, it's basically just a place that you attach food. It has a much shorter leash because you're not going to be swinging it. You just swing it and drop it on the ground. So this is basically a dinner plate for that bird. And then we also have probably the most iconic of all, which is the falconer's glove, also known as the gauntlet. Uh, falconers today obviously still use these, but it's important to understand that falconry is practiced entirely different in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. In the Middle East, traditionally they have not used a glove. They've used something called a mangala, which almost looks like a fur muff without fur on it, and it just covers their forearm, and the bird will sit there. So there's, there's little, you know, regional variations in how the sport is practiced itself. But the United Nations actually just about five years ago, one of their um, kind of subgroups, UNESCO, uh, United Nations Educational Society, da, da, whatever, um, actually declared falconry as a world heritage sport, meaning that um, in any country around the world, falconry has a heritage that people have a right to practice it. Very good. So I'm excited. Let's go meet the birds. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Look forward to it. All right, so this is our first bird. Sure. Uh, so this is Chase. Chase is a uh, five-year-old North American red-tailed hawk. Um, I want to make a real quick kind of clarification. If you notice, he's actually wearing these seamless bands, these aluminum bands on his legs. Uh, that denotes that he's a captive bred bird. So um, with our permit with U.S. Fish and Wildlife as a falconry school, uh, we're required to only use captive bred birds. We talked a little bit earlier about how raptor educators are allowed to use birds that have been injured as part of theirs, so they would not actually have this. Uh, and then falconers, um, apprentice falconers, you know, uh, general master class falconers, when they actually um, go out to trap a bird from the wild, uh, they can actually do that with the proper permits. So they can use wild birds, but our falconry school permit requires us only to use captive bred birds. Got it. Very so good. he was bred in Michigan. 
um, by a former Ohioan who uh, moved up there to start a raptor education group. Um, he's a beautiful demonstration of, uh, of the eastern colorations that you can find. Uh, they can become quite a bit darker out west. Um, you'll notice that his foot size, uh, we're going to have an, uh, another a hawk out, a Harris's hawk later, and you'll see that her toes are l much less thick than, than Chase's toes. But these toes are built uh, to be able to grab and uh, basically control things that will fight back like squirrels. Um, you'll notice we call him a red-tailed hawk, so I'll turn real quick so you can see he has a red tail. And um, they get their red tail after their first molt. So a lot of people are confused. On, on a lot of the different birding sites on Facebook, you'll see people asking for identifications of birds. And when we tell them that it's a red-tailed hawk, they'll go, well, its tail is brown and it has brown bars on it. That can't be a red tail. Every bird molts its feathers every year. And usually you have a difference between the juvenile plumage and the adult plumage in all raptors. Sometimes it's very, very minimal, uh, but there usually are some aspects that are very, very different. So, um, and you can see that he also has dark eyes. So as a juvenile, he would have much lighter eyes. They'd be yellow. He'd have a brown tail. And you'd actually see, he's kind of looking at me going, what are you doing? You'd actually see these striations here wouldn't actually be there. He would just have these little teardrop brown um, uh, colorations along with a much whiter chest. Hmm. Okay. So he is, um, in all birds of prey, the female is a third again larger than the male. So, uh, you know, it's mainly a preferential thing. Some people like to fly the smaller, quicker males. Some people like to fly the bigger, uh, I call them the bombers, uh, which are the females. That's what I prefer because if we're flying squirrels, I find that that extra power from the female can subdue the prey a lot easier. Hmm. Um, the males being much quicker, a lot of people believe that they can actually you know, move their feet real quick to avoid being bitten. But this is the basic type of bird that a new apprentice would be starting out with here okay. in Ohio. So let's see what you have next. Sounds great, thanks. And this is our second bird? Yeah, this is uh, Shelly. She is uh, an anatom peregrine falcon. She's about eight years old. Um, when we talk about the sport of falconry, the three main birds that are used are hawks, um, falcons, and then some people fly actually eagles here in the United States. So Shelly is an anatom peregrine falcon. That's one of three subspecies here in the United States. Uh, this is the bird that you would find living on buildings downtown in Cincinnati, in Dayton, in Columbus, Cleveland. Uh, in fact, they're being, becoming so much, uh, so popular, I shouldn't say popular, but so successful after their reintroduction here in the east that you'll actually find them nesting on bridges, on cranes, all, all over the place. Is this the fastest animal in the world? It is indeed. Now, there are some, some people who will kind of give pushback saying, um, you know, basically anybody could be fast if they were falling straight down. Um, but falcons um, in particular are very, very fast. The peregrine falcon, that's called a rouse. Um, and so uh, peregrine falcons have been recorded at speeds up to 271 miles an hour in a stoop. Um, and that's pretty impressive when you consider um, that uh, the prey species that they're hunting um, is largely birds. So their, their, their um, approach, their strategy is to get much higher than what they're hunting and to come straight down and to break a wing or to hit it and incapacitate it some way so they can follow it down to the ground. This is called rowing. And so falcons will do this. That's called a bait. She'll come back up here in a second. Uh, falcons will sit on their block perches all day and row. They have a very, very high metabolism. And so that's one way of them keeping in shape. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, what do you have next? Great. And who is this? Uh, this is Henson. Henson is a almost two-year-old Eurasian eagle owl. This is the world's largest species of owl, uh, weight-wise. The largest in height is actually the great gray. Um, per its name, the Eurasian eagle owl is actually native to Europe and Asia. And um, the males will um, uh, be about two to three, maybe four pounds. Females will be six pounds up. Um, he's actually about four or five pounds, so he's a good-sized bird. Um, he keeps turning around. Uh, a lot of people go, oh my God, he turns his head. He can do it 360 degrees. Well, birds of prey can't actually do that. Owls, for instance, can turn their head up to 270 degrees because they have twice the number of vertebrae in their neck that we do. Um, another thing that differentiates owls from hawks and eagles is that if you notice, they have two toes up front and two toes in back. Um, hawks and eagles have three toes up front and one in back. 
And so uh, the two up front, two in the back is actually called being zygodactyl. And uh, you know, the benefit of that is largely when uh, they fledge early from the nest and they have to climb back up the tree to get back to their nest, they can utilize that, uh, that uh, zygodactylness, if you will, along with their beak to make that climb. Interesting. Boy, he's got beautiful eyes. Yeah, he does. And there's a theory related to owls that the color of the eye denotes what time of night they actually hunt. So the darker the eye, the later at night when there's much less light. The idea being that with a darker eye, they capture and retain more of the moonlight that, that's out. So the lighter eyed owls like um, Henson here, the theory is that he hunts more at sunup and sundown. Wow. He's big. Look at those feet. Yeah, birds of prey have an incredible amount of crushing pressure per square inch in their feet. Um, uh, anywhere from 100 to um, uh, 1,000 pounds of crushing pressure. So he probably has four or five, or maybe even 600 pounds of crushing pressure in those feet. Amazing. But he's a very gentle sort. With owls, um, you know, when you work with educational owls, you want to imprint them. So you want to raise them to know humans so that they don't have that fear. Yeah. All right, so you have one more to show us? I do, and it's gonna be a special one. We're gonna be doing some flights with that bird. All right, well, Great. let's see it. All right, for our last bird here, um, we're gonna introduce the bird, but I also wanna introduce Rick Hoffman and Carol Inskeep. Uh, they're both part of our raptor team here at the Nature Center. And so, Joe, who do we have here? So this is Sedosa. Sedosa is a six-year-old female Harris's hawk. Harris's hawks are native to the desert southwest of the United States and are the um, only social bird of prey. So they're, they're the most intelligent of all raptors worldwide. According to most recent research, they have the intelligence of a, a six or seven year old kid. So highly intelligent. They actually hunt in family packs. So whereas in most birds of prey, the young are driven out of the territory at 18 to 22 weeks of age, Harris hawks stay around for three to four years. So there truly is um, that, uh, that threat of the teenaged angst, if you will, as part of the family. Uh, but they're great birds. All right, so you're going to fly the birds to, yeah. to Rick and We're going to toss her up in the tree and we're going to show you a little bit about what we do uh, at the Ohio School of Falcon, what people can kind of experience when they come in. Okay. So we're going to have her fly up to this tree over here. She'll make the ultimate choice, but we're going to try to get her. So she wants to be right there. So what we're going to have you do is come on over here. Let me take the, uh, this leash off real quick. And so we're going to have her fly down to your glove. Now, a falconers, when you're working with a bird, you always stand with your left shoulder perpendicular to the bird, kind of like she's set up now. So she can put her arm up and directly out in front of her when I tell her to. That gives that bird a perch that is non-threatening because it's uh, a little bit farther out from the human. You ready? ready. Put that arm up and out. <whistles> Fantastic. Nicely done. Okay. Now what we're going to do is have you turn, and I know I didn't teach you how to do this, but turn and face the tree up there. Let her finish. Your arm straight out to the left, and then you're going to step forward with your right foot, and you're going to move your left arm forward like that. Beautiful. So you've learned how to call a bird to the glove and cast a bird off. This is the falconer's fist pump. So go ahead and take your right hand, just like a bird of prey coming down to grab something. Boom, nicely done. Good job. Are you ready, sir? Sure. Come on over here. I'll have you face me. Okay, arm down by your side, make that fist. Look over your left shoulder, get ready for the incoming flight. Glove straight up and out. <whistles> Boom, perfect. Now you saw a great, great uh, presentation in terms of casting off. So go ahead and turn, arm straight out to the left, and then step forward with your right foot and move your left arm forward. Perfect. Nicely done. Falconer's fist pump. Boom. Well done. Very good. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about before we close the show today? No, I'd just like to thank you for having us down. Um, it's been wonderful. Caesars Creek is a beautiful area. And if you haven't had a chance, make sure you come out to enjoy the, uh, the Nature Center here. They've got lots of great programs. And, um, and the staff here has done a wonderful job in making this uh, uh, not just a, a great ambassador place because you have beautiful uh, treatments for your birds, but also a place you can feel free to, to bring the family as well. Absolutely. So, and the connection that you provide with, with this hands-on experience, um, it, it's, you can talk about it, but to actually yeah. experience this, you know, that bond, that trust that you have with the wildlife is phenomenal. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for bringing your programs out. Um, 
do you do like school gatherings and so we do all sorts of stuff yeah so we um do um uh, works in, in school systems where we'll go in and we'll uh, uh, deliver STEM-based programming. So all of our, pr our programming is STEM-based in relationship to whether we're talking about um, different aspects. Don't worry, she'll, she'll come back. Um, of, uh, of science, technology, you know, um, engineering or math. Uh, and we tailor the program to the class itself. So we work with the teachers to provide a, a really unique way to experience STEM. Um, and we, we offer that all throughout the state. Uh, we also do uh, things like um, Cub Scout troops, birthday parties, um, weddings, any place that we can come in and help share the experience uh, and the message of conservation. Sure. Uh, it's, it's key and important to what we do. And that is an experience of a lifetime. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you so much for, having for us out. coming out. Appreciate it. So that's it for today's show. Thank you for watching. If you'd like more information, you can check out Ohio School of Falconry website and their Facebook page. And you can also check out our website at ohiostateparks.com. We'll see you on the trails. Come on over here. Stand here, glove straight out. Put her on your glove. Okay, so we're gonna do it this way. There you go, so I'll calm down. Okay, now arm straight out. Now all you're gonna do is you basically wanna aim where you want the bird to go. Of course, they never really go where you want them to go. So let's say we're going for that, uh, that limb that's coming out on the side of the pine tree. Okay. So you're just going to step forward with your right foot the same time your left arm goes forward. Okay. Ready? Go. Oh. Well, she, she, she has her favorite perch. <laughs> okay. So you ready? So go ahead and stand face me. Okay. And whenever you're ready, put your arm straight up and out. <whistles> let's tear it apart. There's an amazement when you're sitting there feeding a raptor on the glove. Uh, my particular favorites are hawks, but um, you know they talk about the magic of feeding falcons on the glove and how you help them kind of clean up because they're so gentle when they're eating. But none of my falcons are that gentle when they're eating. So I don't know if it's an old time thing or not. Girl, oh, wait! Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you ready? Put your glove back up. I see what we're doing here. Oh yeah, that's, with Harris Hawks we say you got to be careful of that because they will work you. Um, they will work you quite a bit. <laughs>